It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Changemakers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Women tend to overprepare and underestimate when it comes to their own readiness to try something new. Today's guest, Emma Isaacs, didn't draw up a plan or list her goals. She doesn't believe in work-life balance, and yet somehow she managed to create a multi-million dollar global organization and be recognized as a prominent voice in women's leadership, all while raising six young children. Emma's philosophy is to dive in head first and wing it. Emma is founder and CEO of Business Chicks. She's the author of the book, Winging It, Stop Thinking, Start Doing, Why Action Beats Planning Every Time. Welcome, Emma. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Joan. It's great to be here. So, Emma, let's start off by talking a little bit about your background. You dropped out of college and started a company when you were 18. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. So you can probably tell from my accent that I'm not from here. I'm Australian originally and moved to California five years ago now. So we've been living in the States for that time. And of my six children, half of them have Australian accents and half of them have American (laughs) accents, um, which is great. Um, But yeah, the, the backstory is really that I've always been an entrepreneur, so I've never really worked for anyone else throughout my career. Um, I started my first company when I was 18 years old. As you said, Joan, after dropping out of university, and that in itself was a little bit of a tricky decision that I made for my parents to accept. I come from a very academic family, and of all the grandchildren, I'm the only one without a university degree. Um, But for me, I really felt sure that learning in a university lecture and um, You know, it just wasn't for me. It wasn't going fast enough. And I really wanted to get out into the real world and experiment and and learn things myself. So I dropped out of uni and it was about the same time that I met someone just at a barbecue one weekend and we got talking. She asked me what I was up to and I said I'd just made the decision to to leave university, but I was studying business and wanted to um, major in human resources. And she let me know she had a recruitment company. So in I went for an interview, got the job. um, And soon after her and her business partner split ways you know, all very amicably, they were, they were the best of friends. But as he was walking out the door, he turned around and said to her, if you're going to offer equity to anyone in this company, you'd offer it to that young kid sitting over there. And, that, and he pointed at me. And the reason he said that was because even at a very, very, very early age, I had realized that the way to get ahead was to have a huge amount of optimism and enthusiasm in everything that you did. So I would be the first to arrive at that office before 8 a.m. every single day. I'd be the last person to leave after 8 p.m. I made sure that I was... Um, you know, as useful and as helpful as possible. So I remember when I started in that company, you know, the logo was a different color to the paint on the wall. So I got my dad in to paint the walls the right color. And I saw that we were all answering the phone in a different way. So I read a little manual of how to answer the phone. Um, You know, I just really tried to make sure that um, I was invaluable to them. So that's how I got my start in entrepreneurship. I um, bought into that business with with, um, some savings that I'd had through my one and only job waitressing um, throughout school and for those few months while I went to college and that was my first business I had that company for seven years and it was a great success we um, built it to a a workforce of about 45 people and won a host of awards and soon after a girlfriend invited me along to an event run by a networking organization called Business Chicks and I remember thinking oh my gosh that is the worst company name I've ever heard (laughs) it's it's insulting to women it's derogatory I'm you know I'm a feminist and I, I believe in you know equal rights for men and women of course but um, I advocate for women everywhere I go and I'm a professional entrepreneur and I'm not going to anything that calls themselves chicks you know that's just not for me and she said listen you must get over yourself and come along and experience this so I, I went along to the business chicks event and it was like nothing else I'd ever seen before you know people were really supportive of one another they were hugging and high-fiving and they were, it was just a really really beautiful um, environment and I remember going back to my recruitment company 
and encouraging everyone to become members. And a few months later, I, I bought that business. Um, I heard <laughs> it was for sale and I, I bought the business. So that was 15 years ago now. Um, we started with 200 members. We now have over half a million members across the globe. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm still as excited about the organization as I was 15 years ago. So that's a little bit about the, the backstory, Joan. Well, you know, Emma, when I received your book, Winging It, I loved everything about it. And, and here's why. So I had started a career after college and I got married and then I had decided to be a stay-at-home, kind of work-from-home wife and mother. And so then for the, the next 17 years, that was what I had done. And after doing that, I pretty much lost sense of who I was. And so all the work that I'm doing now is from a, a point of my life in middle age, mind you, in my 40s, when I had really lost my identity and was trying to reclaim it. That was the seed of the work. What took place after that was because I was changing our relationship, my 23-year marriage ended, and then my mother and my sister died. So within a period of six months, my marriage ended. I had this self-esteem crisis. My mother died. My sister died. My oldest son left for college. And so everything that I'm doing is from that period of my life. But the part that I loved about your book when I go out and I speak or I'm interviewed, people will say to me, okay, so how did you create this radio show and this multimedia communications company and this digital magazine? And often I have to think about it, but honestly, it was because mm-hmm. I was winging it. In the beginning, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. I just went for it and figured it out mm. as I went along. And so when you say, mm. you know, action, it beats planning every time. I'm a living example of your philosophy, and I mm. wanted to share that with you. Mm, that's beautiful, and thank you so much for letting me into to your your story. And um, that's an incredible achievement to triumph over all that uh, adversity. And and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, through my work at Business Chicks of building this organisation, we've been very very blessed to work alongside incredibly successful people. You know, people like Sir Richard Branson, Ariana Huffington, Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Brene Brown, all these people. I've brought out um, to both the US and and Australia and toured with them. So I've got to spend meaningful time alongside them. And, you know, it's the the common themes are there. I I studied these people and what I learned, you know, parallels your experience, they didn't know what they were doing when they started out. You know, what separates those people um, from perhaps the people who are stuck and living in inertia is that they got into action. They didn't exactly know what they were doing. They didn't have a really, really set clear plan for it. They didn't have a roadmap for how they were going to get there, but they just put one foot in front of the other. And as you did, they, they just began. And I think there's a real there's a real beauty and a magic in that. And really, that's what the book is, you know, based on. And so he's learning from these amazing people who have done just that like you did. So, Emma, these are scary times that we're living in right now. Have you adjusted mm-hmm. any of your beliefs due to what we're experiencing in the world today? Or do you think it's really the appropriate time to just go for something? Yeah, that's a great, 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 great question. Um, And obviously, it's been such a challenging time for so many people, you know, whether you're in business or not. And we have certainly had to adjust, um, you know, perhaps not our thinking, but certainly adjust our business model, certainly adjust the way in which we deliver services. So we make a lot of our revenues through these large um, you know, live events. So we'll bring two or 3,000 women together in a room and present amazing speakers. So when um, the pandemic hit, we, you know, that part of our business was completely decimated. Um, it, it really has brought to the fore, um, you know, really great leaders and really strong leadership. And I'd like to think that we, we fall into that bucket. Um, you know, when, when the world went into lockdown, I called the team together and I have a CEO in the business as well. And I just said to them, you know, listen, we're, we're going to go through this as gently as possible. We're going to do it together. We're going to, um, you know, dig deep. And ultimately how we want to um, play this is with the end in mind. And no one knows when the end is coming, whether, you know, we can all be allowed out of our homes and back to business in six months or 12 months or, or two years. But what I said to the team was this, you know, we want to emerge from this and be proud of the way we handled ourselves. We want to use this time to innovate. We want to use this time to create. Um, and we want to use this time to support one another. And that all sounds really, really great. Um, you know, I suppose philosophically, but how does that play out when you're actually in a business 
that's you know losing money and and people are um, you know people are scared about their job security and their partners are losing their jobs and you know they're worried about their health. So you know I don't want to minimize this time at all or downplay it all, at all because it's, it's been had such a huge impact. I think I think the thing that I always um, fall back on and you ask about changing the thinking is. I've always tried to have this philosophy of being kind to myself and, you know, really trying to say to myself, you're doing your best. Like in every single moment, you're doing your best. And I'm sure you've had many, many, many moments like that in your life as well. You know, just returning to this this idea that we can be a lot kinder and, and more gentle on ourselves. And, um, you know, that plays out with my parenting as well. As you said, I have six young kids. They range from 11. Um, I have an 11-year-old, 9, 7, 5, 3, and three months a little guy's uh, a little oh. newy yeah he's gorgeous he's great um you know and and you can imagine you can just imagine the chaos that that um is our household at times and i'll always fall back to that that thinking of you know what well, i'm doing my best in every moment it's not always it's far from perfect it's mostly not not perfect but i do just try to draw on that thinking and 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 say to myself you know you're doing your best and and that generally works for me so, Emma, let's stay with that for a moment. As you said, you have six children um, ranging mm-hmm. from three months to 11, and God bless you from one mother to another. <laughs> but, um, you know, having six children alone without trying to run a business, it's, you know, it's mind-boggling. I can remember during the time when my children were little and I was trying to work out of the house, I can remember one day mm. being on a business call with a gentleman and I was literally locked in my upstairs bathroom with both of my boys banging mm. on the door and I was trying to sound professional and finally the man let me <laughs> off the hook and he said it's okay I have kids but what are some of your favorite hacks that enable you to get anything done <laughs> that's a great question that's a beautiful story as well and and hasn't it just been wonderful in the pandemic you know seeing humanity kind of uh, you know come to light we, we no longer have to sort of hide in the bathroom and, and pretend like we don't have children you know I mean it's um it's just been great we've I've yeah. really enjoyed you know I mean we're, we're all living on zoom and um you know I've just released this book and I'm doing podcasts and it's it's wonderful and there's been many times my kids have walked in and and you know the interviewer said oh no it's fine let, you know, let them be and it's it's just lovely to see that people are you know truly these days you know having being allowed to bring their whole selves to work so I think that's really really fun um, okay, so let's talk about some some hacks. Um, so I love this stuff. I mean, I think more than anything, um, what people don't realize is that time is your absolute number one asset, you know, and we all have to get a little bit obsessed with, you know, thinking about how we spend our time and where we put our time and how we can get a little bit more of it. And, you know, constantly asking ourselves, is this what I want to be doing in this moment? Is there someone else who could feasibly be doing this, jo- this job or task better than me and perhaps um, faster than me and perhaps you know more more cheaply than than I can be doing it because we all know that um, you know if we sat down and did an exercise and worked out how much we're worth um, an hour we'd quickly figure out that we can get other people to do it for a lot more um, you know a lot more affordably and effectively so but in terms of the the juggle around the house um, I'm really really into systems so um, you know we I make sure I have different places in the house but I've got four young girls and and two little guys so I make sure that there's you know hairbrushes and um, detangler spray in like three three places in the house um, I make sure there's a pair of scissors in three or four places in the house um, you know I make sure that when we get up in the morning all the kids lunch boxes are lined up in alphabetical order um, you know I'm, I'm just constantly trying to look for ways that bring a little bit of order to the chaos and, um, you know, help us all out because you do spend a lot of time looking for things um, each day. Um, I'm a big proponent of the idea of um, doing things now. So when you think of um, something that needs to be done, whether that's buying a kid's birthday present or, I don't know, um, booking a doctor's appointment, don't write it on a list and, and let it sit there for the next, you know, couple of weeks. Just get into action and, and, and do it now. What else would I say? The systems are really important in terms of doing it now. That's, that's another really great uh, little hack. Um, you know, I think it's difficult and I, I completely understand that not everyone can afford childcare, you know, and, and childcare comes in so many different forms. And, you know, living in America, we certainly don't have the support of family. So we 
have to have um, you know some help around the house with our um, with some babysitters, which has been really really useful. So I think managing those relationships and and having really open lines of communication is is really really important. And you know making sure that you um, reward the people that support you if you're lucky enough to have help um, with raising your family. And I think also it's it's true like as your kids get a little bit older, they also learn to pitch in and 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 do some chores, which um, you know I'm I'm desperately trying to encourage them to do that because I want them to be independent. Um, people. So yeah, I'd say it's it's definitely a team effort. And Emma, we hear so much about achieving work-life balance. And I know that when women, you know, they experience chaos in their home, and you've been using the word controlled chaos, and I want to talk about that. When they, when things Mm. don't go the way they plan, they tend to think they're doing something wrong, and then they start beating themselves up. So what do you say Mm. about work-life balance and working in this controlled chaos? How does this all tie together? Well, for for me, the idea of work-life balance is it's a little bit hard to um, wrap my head around. And what I mean by that is when when you say the word work-life balance, what comes to mind for me is someone standing there and and typically a a woman, it's a, you know, falls to a woman, it's a woman's problem. Typically a woman standing there with her arms stretched out, you know, looking like a a set of scales, you know, Mm -hmm. and and for me, the idea of work-life balance kind of means that you've got to have your work and your life perfectly balanced at all times and this kind of, perfect equilibrium and it's just not a reality that any of us can attain it's completely elusive to think that so instead of trying to strive for this you know unrealistic ideal that we should have everything completely 50 50 all the time um you know i'm constantly just trying to be present in whatever activity i'm doing so when i'm working i'm trying to be completely present in my work of course that's very very hard at the moment but um you know i will try and shut my door and, and say to the kids listen mommy needs half an hour to get this done and when I'm parenting, I'm I'm trying to be completely present in that activity. And again, I fail all the time, but that means, you know, putting the phone away and, and trying to be where I am at any one moment. Um, I think also when I talk about it in the book a little bit, work-life balance and, and trying to, you know, get get more of it. I mean, what we're, what we're saying when we talk about work-life balance is people just want to get more living into their life, right? They just mm-hmm. want to be able to find more time to enjoy themselves. They want to be able to find more time to do the things that give them energy. They want to find more time to do the things that they enjoy. And for me, a big part of that is learning um, and practicing this idea of saying no. So for me in my life so far, I, I really try and excel in just two areas and that's my work and, and um, you know, my home life. Um, I'm a pretty lousy friend. You know, I've got a very, very close set of girlfriends that I keep in contact with and they're, they're very forgiving if I don't call them for a few weeks, mm-hmm. you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm not running around saying yes to every single event and social gathering and activity. And, you know, I'm focused um, on my work and on my family. I'm, I'm not running marathons or exercising, you know, once or twice a day. I'm, you know, I'm with my family or, or in my business. So I, I think this idea of um, really practicing saying no to the things that don't give you energy is, is really, really important as well. So, Emma, you're a boss who is described as being a delight. Those two words, boss and delight, don't usually go together. So what type of boss are you? What's your approach to running a company? I love that. Um, I I think if you spoke to any of my people, um, you know, they'd say to you that I'm a kind leader. um, I'm hopefully a generous leader. Um, They'd say I listen well. um, But they'd also say that I'm, I'm, you know, a, a pretty firm leader. So... I'm not someone who shies away from making the difficult calls. Um, you know, I think we have to remember that business is, is actually quite easy. You know, you just have to make more money than you spend. And, um, you know, at times that 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 takes making hard decisions. Um, so I think they'd tell you that, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart and um, a, a great leader, but also someone who... Um, has really explored this notion of being liked and, and people pleasing throughout their career because I think um, leadership is not for everyone and, and being a boss is, is not for everyone. And if you have the disease to please or if you you know really feel the need to be liked by every single person who comes into your life, you're going to struggle to be a strong leader. So, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely um, not perfect and completely fallible as every single human is, but I think um, ultimately they'd say that I'm someone who is kind and generous but also can make tough decisions. And, you know, it's interesting, Joan, I've had the business for 15 years now, and in that time we probably had six or seven people who have worked in the company for four or five years and then 
you know, spread their wings and gone somewhere else and then returned to, to business trips and done another three or four years. Um, you know, my CEO in the business, she's on her third stint of working alongside me. She worked in my recruitment company for many years and then um, she had a break somewhere else and came to across to business chicks and did four years there and then went somewhere else and came back into the CEO role. So I think that might tell you something about the culture that we've built and the way that we're able to not only attract people but, um, you know, walk alongside them and help develop their careers at the same time. And it absolutely does because what it shows is that you're a relationship builder. You're not someone who burns bridges or, you know, tries to see what they can get from someone. You're all about cultivating win-win situations and relationships, and that's why you've done as well as you have. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think if you look at the two companies that I've run, one was a recruitment company and now one's a membership organization, um, and both of those businesses rely on one thing, and that's people and relationships. And I think that's something that we can all spend more time focusing on. You know, I'm someone who is known to write um, 600 holiday cards at the end of the year, and a lot of people might think, oh, gosh, that's such a silly use of a founder's time to be, you know, sitting there writing um, holiday cards. And I remember someone coming into my business, um, and she was she was new to the company, and she saw me sitting there with these piles of cards and my pen and she said to another one of the employees oh my gosh like surely someone else can be doing that for her like this is not the best use of her time and the employee um, the other employee who'd been with me for years said you're not getting it you know for Emma this is this is this is her work you know her work is to see people her work is to appreciate people her work is to make people feel better it's, and it's to build those relationships and you know, I, I love what Dr. Lois Frankel says about relationships. And she says, when you need a relationship, it's too late to build one. And that's so true. You know, I mean, and we've seen that um, play out time and time, time and time again this year during the pandemic. You know, we, when we had to pivot our entire business model to online delivery of events, you know, I had to call in all these favors of speakers, um, you know, that have spoken for us over the years. And I had to say to them, listen, guys, you know, 80% of our business has been wiped out and, you know, here's me calling in a favor and, you know, will you do X, Y, Z for, for me? And, you know, they, they all said yes, because if you treat people well and if you're kind mm-hmm. and if you give them value and if you're doing favors all the time, there's there's an emotional equity there and people will feel feel more um, inclined to help you and, 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 and want to be there for you. So I, I think relationships are really, really important, whether that's with your clients or your team or your suppliers or or whoever it is so we should always be investing in them for sure the book is winging it stop thinking start doing why action beats planning every time if you'd like to get more information about emma and her work you can visit emmaisaacs.com emma thank you so much for joining us it has been such a pleasure speaking with you thanks so much for the opportunity joan appreciate it this is conversations with joan until next time thanks for tuning in